Hi there, my name is Amanda McCulloch and I'm the Data Visualization Society Operations Director. We've been featuring different stories around the ways in which data is being used to inform the response around COVID-19. And there's been a lot of focus around different ways that models are being used to help us understand what could happen regarding the trajectory of the disease in other countries and here in the US. Today, I'm joined by Eric, who will be speaking with us about the work that he's doing on open source model development and working with the different models that are out there and creating new ways of interacting with that information, um, both in the front end and for people who are more technical. Um, Eric, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Amanda. It's great to be here. Sure. Can you tell me a bit more about you, your background, and where you work? Sure. Uh, so my name is Eric Davis. I'm a principal scientist at Galois. Uh, and what Galois is for folks who don't know is we're an employee owned research lab that is science led with a strong commitment to open science uh, and having an impact with our work. Um, my background is primarily in uh, computer science and computer engineering. Uh, I got my PhD from the University of Illinois, uh, got to do a lot of fun work uh, while I was there and then uh, for a while was a, a professor at the University of Miami and Iowa State before coming out to Galois so that I could focus more on applied research uh, and having an impact with the work as well. Uh, miss teaching a lot, but one of the great things here is we get to release everything open source and have some fantastic engineering teams uh, and have spent the, the last two years more or less working on uh, something I hoped I would never have to use, which was uh, helping to improve our ability to respond with data and model-driven science during a crisis. Uh, and so now we've been afforded this unique situation where we've been asked to help with the COVID response uh, by helping to uh, vet current existing models and data, make them more accessible to policymakers and domain scientists. Uh, and it's giving us a real opportunity to learn about what's most difficult about these uh, um, kind of crisis response situations, uh, but also to leverage the tools that we've been developing with the federal government. Interesting. As, the, as an Illinois native and the daughter of two U of I alumni, I am, I'm very honored to be speaking with you today and apologize for not giving you the appropriate title and putting doctor before your name when we launched this interview. Oh, uh, we, we, we don't use titles around Gawa anyway. Our, our focus is more on the science. I appreciate that. Um, so as we look at kind of the work that you're doing, can you tell us a bit, in a bit more detail about this effort that you have underway to make these general data models about COVID-19 more adaptable to local factors and who your collaborators are in this kind of work? Sure. Um, so this is the outgrowth really of two programs that we've been involved with uh, with DARPA. Uh, the first one is automated scientific knowledge extraction. And the idea there is we want to be able to take uh, equations that we find in papers, uh, diagrams, process models, and turn them into executable code uh, directly with scientists and practitioners without the need for them to engage with software engineers. So it's about automatic code synthesis from visual languages. Uh, the goal here being that if we can help the scientists stay in the metaphors that are most uh, comfortable to them, uh, they'll make fewer mistakes. It'll take less time to develop code uh, and also to allow them to more quickly analyze and check code for errors. Mm -hmm. uh, on the world modeler side, we've been working on taking found codes. So this is a model someone else has developed uh, that are oftentimes very difficult to run and execute. They you, are something that maybe someone's grad student can run very easily if they're very familiar with it. Uh, but during a crisis, uh, it may not be possible to get that expert knowledge in time to execute the model with local adaptation. And so we've been uh, trying to deploy the technologies we've been developing in both of these areas uh, with partners in uh, the state of Ohio, uh, with the federal government, uh, the state of Oregon, and a number of other places where we have connections like Arizona uh, to help people respond in a more timely fashion uh, to emerging crises. And one of the big goals here is we want to make sure that the models we're developing are more adaptable so that people can get uh, more of a local view of what's going on. A, a lot of the analyses we've seen have been at the national or state level, uh, but they neglect certain things like the, the difficulties of planning in a state with a distributed population. Uh, we hear a lot about the crisis in New York City, but uh, one of the partners that contacted us was Oneida County, New York, in upstate New York. Uh, they have their own mini version of the crisis going on. Uh, and with all of the resources focusing on New York City, one of the questions was, how is their response dealing with things? How will they know uh, before things get out of hand? And so we've been working to, to help adapt a lot of these uh, technologies to these individual partners and to give them these very local views. Um, thankfully, with none of our partners, we've had to, we, we haven't had to worry about uh, hospital overruns because social distancing has been in place. But another set of models we were generating early on was looking at not only 
the state available resources in terms of beds and respirators, but their distribution in the state and the likelihood that they might need to be borrowed. Uh, for instance, in Ohio, we have three major cities, uh, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland. Uh, those resources are distributed not only amongst those cities, but also in the smaller areas. You know, Athens, Ohio is a university town that has some resources. Those aren't necessarily redeployable to Cleveland or Cincinnati or Columbus because they're so far away and might be needed by the local government. So part of what we've been helping people understand too is um, that possible eventuality in planning. Just because your state has these respirators doesn't mean that you can deploy them locally. Uh, a big question is just what's available in the municipal area. I think that's a big pitfall we fell, fall into da with data a lot is around looking kind of aggregations and counts and not looking at that distribution piece, especially when geography matters so much. I know we've seen a ton of maps around COVID-19, but the question I tend to ask is, what added value are we gaining from plotting that data geospatially and how is that informing our decisions, which can be really tricky. I spoke with a, a, a friend of mine who has her MPH and is a local rural uh, township trustee in Granville, Ohio, and she had some of similar responses around some of the challenges they're facing with questions that are coming up in more rural areas. So it's great to hear that you're engaging with local governments in that way, because I think that a lot of those stories get hidden in a lot of the big red bubble maps that we keep seeing pop out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, cur I'm curious from your side, um, how do you feel like this effort that you guys have undertaken uh, really builds on or diverges from the modeling efforts that have made headlines, thinking of things like the IHME model that's being shared around and widely shared on social media and even through White House briefings? Well, one of the big things we've been trying to do with our effort is to build tools that build on these efforts and help people to establish things like model credibility and identify possible mistakes. Uh, and if I can share for a second uh, an example uh, that might be interesting. There's a, uh, a model, and, and I'll say it's a very good model, produced by uh, Gabrielle Go uh, on epidemiology that has made the round. It was in a lot of the more popular blog posts that were shared. Uh, and we had some comments from folks where they, they wanted to leverage this model and be able to use it. And, you know, usefully, we're given the, the set of equations that produce this model. Uh, so when we were working on the model credibility piece, we actually uh, decided to leverage some of the tools that we were building. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, pull up uh, the, the Go model. Uh, one of the things we've been working with is ways to generate code faster than writing it. If I implement this in Python, I can make mistakes. If I implement this in, you know, by uh, plugging it into some equation solver, uh, I've got to make sure I get everything right. Um, so we actually have the ability to take uh, found equations uh, that are written in several different languages. This happens to be in a common scientific publication markup language called uh, LaTeX. Uh, we render the set of equations so that we can check them against uh, the equations that we're modeling. And in this case, we checked all these values to make sure they, they matched uh, Go's model. Uh, but when we simulated, one of the things we noticed was we weren't getting the same results. And this was something our partners were commenting on. They said, you know, I'm, I'm using his equations, but I can't get his results. So obviously, there's a divergence between the equations and the implemented model. And this is actually a very common error that we see. People make mistakes. The mistakes proliferate in what's uh, written up. Um, we had some experience with these compartmental models in the past. We've been studying them for the last two years as part of our ongoing efforts in epidemiology. So I know, for instance, one of the things that this is missing is the, the volumetric component. And this is just saying, my infection rate depends not only on the current infected and susceptible individuals and my parameters, but also the total individuals in my population. So if I go through and I correct this model by adding these terms uh, and then regenerate the code, we can in real time generate results that match what we're getting uh, from Go's model. And this is actually building that code in real time uh, behind the scenes, generating uh, the model. And this model not only generates graphs that we can share and data and outcomes, but the model itself can now be distributed to individuals uh, who want to make use of this. Um, and not only that, but you can come in and further specialize this model with other uh, assumptions. We could add, for instance, a percent hospitalization or a case fatality rate and see how this model adapts then to those uh, you know, individual locations. You can also change the, the various parameters that uh, Go gives in his dashboard. And it gives you this ability to not only um, play with the model and look at the data outputs, but then generate code that can feed into other types of analyses. Hmm. 
I love how you kind of take something that seems really kind of complex and hard to understand and really break it down that way. Because I feel like even someone who's not as familiar with all the different components that goes into a model like this and people mainly looking at these front ends where I can drag a slider back and forth and pick different values. Um, trying to make that information more accessible is really a great goal to have in terms of the focus we have on these models right now. Uh, I'm curious, what additional kind of interesting use cases or questions do you feel like you're addressing with some of the work that you guys are doing right now? Well, one of the other big pieces that we've been trying to address is information on early warning signs now that we've gone to this stage three opening. Um, I think we know as a society that social distancing has been a good outcome. Um, if you do comparisons on states that have and have not socially distanced, uh, you see uh, massively different results. And those that uh, shut down early and have been fairly uh, faithful in that shutdown have seen better results than those that haven't. And one of the things we've been producing there is a series of dashboards that right now they're still in a very prototype stage like a lot of the tools we have. It's uh, one of the challenges of crisis response is you don't have the same uh, coding and development cycle that you might want for uh, finished products. Um, but for instance, this is a, a look at data for Oneida County, New York. And one of the things they asked us to help them look for was early warning signs uh, that they may be in more trouble coming up. And what you see here in gray is a measure of social mobility that we're building from uh, a set of ensemble data sets. And we noticed last weekend, for instance, that there was a spike in social mobility. So this meant that uh, for whatever reason, maybe it was just a particularly nice weekend, uh, people had relaxed the social distancing they were showing. And we generally see this associated with a peak in infections afterwards. Um, you can see uh, in uh, Multnomah County, Oregon, uh, the, the most populous county in Oregon, uh, there have been these periodic spikes in not only social mobility, but then also a, a lag response in the death and infection rates that has come with this. And that's one piece of evidence, for instance, that social distancing has these negative outcomes uh, when, when removed. Another example is just to look at counties and places that haven't been social distancing. Iowa, for instance, has not really implemented uh, stay-at-home orders. Uh, we see much higher levels of social mobility in Iowa. And as a result, if you compare Iowa and Oregon, Iowa is, both has uh, fewer people, about a million less, uh, and a less dense population, yet they've had uh, more deaths than Oregon and uh, more infections. So they've kind of had these worse outcomes. And that's uh, largely due to the fact that they've not been containing the infection the same way. Uh, and we see similar things when we look at other counties that, that haven't been in implementing these policies. So part of what we're doing is trying to just provide some adaptable dashboards and kind of early warning signs that something may be coming. Because I think one of the things we're most worried about is not having a repeat of previous pandemics where there have been second and third spikes, oftentimes much worse than the original, um, that have resulted when social distancing was relaxed too early. And looking at this, most of the examples we've looked at today are focused in the U.S. Is there an ambition that this be usable in other countries or other environments? Absolutely. We've actually got some uh, foreign data sets that we've been working with. Uh, so we've done some comparisons, for instance, to uh, the outcomes that Korea and Japan have looked at. Japan's been particularly interesting because most recently they've had to uh, reinstate their stay-at-home orders uh, because the population of infected was spiking again. Um, we haven't produced visualizations yet for that because we don't have any partners uh, in those countries, but we have been using them as comparative models. Because uh, one of the things that our partners have been struggling with the most is saying, well, what's the most predictive model? Uh, IHME tells us something very optimistic. Uh, the models we're getting from other partners like MITRE uh, are perhaps more pessimistic than they'd like to believe are, are the outcomes. And one of the best models we found is comparative models of other states and municipalities, other countries, uh, where we can find similar populations. Uh, this is also helpful in justifying uh, the policies that are being put into place because uh, I think we're all chafing under the stay at home and social distancing orders. It's not fun. Uh, work from home is, is not the best uh, outcome for anyone, I think, um, but it's working. And part of what we're doing is not only supporting new policy development through these visuals, but comparative policy analysis. So that when someone says, why are we doing social distancing? It's hurting our economy, it's hard. Um, I don't like it. You can say, well, here are the outcomes of places that are similar to us that haven't. And generally what we're seeing is worse outcomes in those cases. So it helps people to understand the impact of the policies. Because uh, I think like it, it's almost similar to the cybersecurity conundrum. Mm -hmm. If I build a lot of security on my system to try to prevent someone from breaking in and breaching and exposing my data, uh, I have less of a chance of that happening. So two years down the road, people can say, why did we do all this uh, work to prevent a breach when we didn't have one? Uh, 
in this case, for better or for worse, we actually do have examples of uh, states, municipalities, uh, counties, countries that aren't uh, using social distancing and stay at home orders. Uh, so we can do comparative analysis. And it's unfortunate for the people in those areas, but uh, it does help us understand the comparative policy a little better than we usually get access to. It certainly gives all of us who work in public public health a way to rely on a bit more data, I think, when we when people say, you know, we shouldn't have done all these things. We overreacted. And instead, I, again, unfortunate that there are, are different municipalities who are dealing with that. But I do think there's value in looking at that data and kind of cr finding those points of relevant comparison. So that, that seems like data I will be interested in seeing as it moves forward. Yeah, um, I, as you think, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, so as you think about the way data visualization is being used to communicate model outputs, we've looked at a couple examples of dashboards that you have, and you think about those pieces. What challenges have you encountered throughout the design process of putting these different visualizations together? Well, I think one of the, the biggest challenges with visualizations is, um, you know, one size doesn't fit all. We, we definitely need different ways to visualize not just data, but models, depending on the individual user, which is something we've, we've worked with in a more theoretical sense on these programs uh, before COVID-19, uh, but we're getting exposure to the need for rapid development now. Uh, we have been able to put in some tools for rapid model development using multiple visual languages. And uh, you know, I, I had showed you already the uh, differential equation editor, uh, which we have here. Um, we had already been developing other metaphors for, for this uh, sort of model development. So here's an example of the same tool uh, generating a model with a more graphical element. So in this case, we have movable nodes. Uh, each of these nodes is parameterized with different values, uh, but it, it still implements the same differential equations on the back end and can be used to synthesize an executable model. Uh, so the goal here was to say, we don't want to be prescriptive to an expert and say, this is exactly how you have to visualize these models. This is how you have to build and interact with them. Uh, we want to be able to do the same thing with visualizations. And so I think moving forward, uh, we're going to be doing a lot more research on building languages for automatic generation of visualization uh, that are accessible to policymakers and domain experts so that you don't have to go through and modify uh, D3 visualizations or your Python backend just to generate a graph that is appropriate something that's more explainable in a, a closer to human language or closer to natural language would, would definitely be a big help here because one of the greatest, I think, um, stumbling blocks uh, in our way in crisis response is how quickly we can respond to the changing environment. A few weeks ago, everyone was worried about economic models. Now everyone's worried about uh, return infections and second peak models. Um, the targets change very quickly. And we're in this exciting uh, and frantic phase of shifting goalposts just because the challenges change every day. Uh, and the tools we have have to be a lot more adaptable. The ones we've been working with traditionally have not been. Well, and the use of iconography on that example that you just pulled up is fascinating because I haven't seen that in any of the other models or things we've looked at throughout COVID-19 or even really in my public health career of trying to really take a concept and make it accessible through something that's as widely used in the world as icons. And so while there's a lot of complex math happening in the back end, this idea about accessibility is important. I'm curious though, do you feel like someone landing on that page um, is your kind of target audience someone who understands all that math that happens and it's just an easier way of interacting with it? Or is it meant for a kind of different user group? So our target audience is, I would say, very broad. And one thing that about this uh, interface that we're building is that it is adaptable. So when we look at these icon-based interfaces, the goal is that you can just interact with uh, the, the raw icons and put them together and only expose uh, these um, parameters that are kind of available in the visual interface or that you can actually dive into it and get access to the raw math. So this is actually built with a process algebra in the back end that generates the differential equations. Um, but you can actually come through and change the way these are represented, change the colors that are used in these cases, uh, and uh, do minor cosmetic updates, but also do functional updates uh, by changing the code or the parameters. And part of what we're working with here is the idea that there's, there's likely no one visual metaphor that works for everyone. We want visual metaphors that are adaptable in real time, uh, that suit whoever the actual modeler is. So if you're more comfortable working in differential equations, you can stay in that. If you wanna work with an icon-driven interface, uh, that's an option. And if you wanna dive into to what's actually in these icons uh, and kind of access their, their actual functional uh, elements, 
that's fine too. You can also work with the generated code that's synthesized. Uh, we're not trying to be prescriptive. What we're trying to do is provide a sort of adaptable set of abstractions so that we can hide inputs that might be confusing. Uh, we can expose elements that we think are useful to the domain scientists, but also so that we can change this visual language on demand to suit different users. Someone at the CDC, for instance, might want an entirely different uh, set of icons than someone at the NIH. Uh, someone at the NIH might say, you know what, just give me the raw differential equations. And you might even encounter someone who's a software engineer that says, just expose the raw code to me. I'm more comfortable working uh, in a terminal and seeing that kind of output. So, so the goal is to be flexible and adaptive. Um, too often applications require you to learn them. Our goal at Galois is building applications that learn the user and so that you form more of a human machine team uh, than a confused human with a learning curve for the application. What an interesting way of kind of rethinking our ideas around user-centered design and this idea of the, the person and the computer being a team together instead of the computer interface serving the person and the prescriptive list of needs. I think that's a a really interesting thing. I'm going to have to mull over a little bit more. The uh, I know one of the areas that we've been focused on a lot is the data visualization community, kind of zooming away from COVID-19 specifically, is this big question on ethics. And mm -hmm. when we make data visual, we imply a certain amount of certainty. What responsibility do we have as data visualization experts or data scientists in what we present and share, especially in a time of crisis? And when I was kind of poking around and learning a bit more about Galois, one of the things that stuck out to me was this, uh, this concept of a boundary policy that came up on your website that really seemed to focus on the, the goal and, and the role of intention in the work that you take on and, and what kind of work you do. And so can you just tell us a little bit more about that policy and, and what it means for you as a scientist at Galois? Well, the boundary policy is, uh, it's kind of a way to state some of our core community values about the work that we're doing and our commitment to deep trust and integrity in that work. Uh, uh, there are a lot of threads at Gawa. We do a lot of work from cybersecurity, uh, crypto, voting, uh, now some epidemiological and crisis response, AI, human machine teaming. But the core to all of this is trustworthiness. We want to build systems that the user can establish authentic trust in. So the systems I've been showing you are, are prototype systems. We've been developing them uh, only over a fairly short period of time. Uh, they're getting exposed now. Uh, they, they've been open source, by the way, from the beginning. So feel free to drop by our web page and download and play with any of the code I've shown you today. Um, but uh, we, we don't want to imply that they're perfect yet. We're deploying them now because we have a unique and hopefully once in a lifetime opportunity to truly respond to a crisis. Um, but part of what we're trying to engineer into future versions of these tools is also this concept of tracking trust and provenance and model outputs and data. Um, and this isn't just even that perhaps the application you're using might have bugs in it, and we're, we're all familiar with software bugs. It could also be something like invalidation of a study. So we see a lot of uh, challenges to studies, uh, refuting hypotheses, and one of the goals we have with this program uh, that's kind of built around this, our boundary policy is to build deeper trust in these tools. So we can produce a tool that might help you analyze two different competing hypotheses. Uh, you can load, for instance, into our modeling tool, two separate models, look at their predictive outcomes, and ask questions about what you might use to discriminate between them. Maybe they make the same prediction in one metric, but there's another metric in which they differ. So you might be able to establish credibility by studying that more. Uh, we're building some provenance techniques into some of the tools we're generating with world modelers as well, so that, for instance, if a model becomes deprecated, someone says, you know what, the model that I published a year ago, don't use it, we have new, uh, a new study which updates the model. And maybe it's not that the model was wrong, but the new model is better. There's this kind of, kind of uh, progress in science of always trying to achieve better and higher fidelity results. And a study from two years ago may be fine, but it may have substantially more error than something produced this year. And that's, that's a big part of what we're doing here. And, and a big part of all the work that we're doing at, at Gawa is this commitment to open science, trustworthy science, uh, and also to pick projects that we think have this uh, potential for public good. Uh, we have a strong policy of not doing harm with the research that we're doing at Gawa as well. Well, and that kind of first principle about do no harm, I think, applies so far beyond medicine and applies to a lot of the work that we do in so many other spaces, especially as we're informing the individual decisions that people make, the, their ability to abide by public health requirements or requests or not, and those different pieces. So I feel like it's just such a, a unique time to be in a position of trying to demystify and unpack that black box. 
that right now most people are seeing in the form of curves or prints or static graphs on the New York Times, but trying to figure out ways to make that more accessible and comparable. And in some ways, it sounds like create kind of a peer review process and ways of, of engaging with these models. That's not just blindly accepting them, but really thinking more critically about what might be missing, like the example we talked about earlier. Uh, is there well, anything that you, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that that topic too, for anyone who wants to dig more into it, I, I just put in a plug for the NIH's uh, interagency modeling uh, working group, uh, IMAG. Uh, they've been doing a lot of work recently on the question of model credibility. And I believe they have published uh, through some of their documents a set of 10 steps towards establishing credibility of models, reproducibility of models, and making sure that there are evaluatable artifacts as a result of work that's being done. It's one thing to throw up a graph and say, here's what my model predicts. But if you don't give the parameterization for your curve fitting or the exact equation you used to, to fit the curve, uh, it makes it very hard to check your results. Uh, the best cases is when you have full write-ups, full source code, and data available as well. And that sounds like one great resource. Are there any other resources that you would recommend or other tips, tricks, things you want to share with the DataViz community before we wrap up? Uh, I'm wow. I mean, there's too many to even track these days. We're keeping track of some uh, through our blog that we've been using. You know, of course, we've been using things like the JHU data set. Um, 1.3 acres has been a great source of data. The individual states are producing some tremendous data uh, repositories. Um, I, I think the NIH is doing some of the best work right now in model credibility. Uh, so they're a good source for that. But in general, there's been a push by a lot of professional organizations like the IEEE, the ACM to improve these reproducible artifacts as well. So I just encourage everyone to keep doing what, what's being recommended by these groups and uh, you know, always publish your artifacts. <laughs> well, it's been tremendous and wonderful to connect with you today, learn more about the work you guys are doing, be able to dig into that. Uh, I hope folks will dig in and, and click on a couple of these links in the Associated Nightingale article. Um, we'll be writing up and sharing some of the links that Eric shared with us today. Uh, if you have questions, you can obviously go and check out the Galois website and their blog for more information. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and sign off for today. Thank you again, Eric, for your time, and we'll look forward to continuing to see updates to how these tools evolve. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Eric.